Hey, good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the CMS contractor training. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their participation today and for your attendance. I uh, just want to let everyone know as well that this session is being recorded to support future training and that by attending this training, you consent uh, to having this, this session recorded. Also, just want to let everyone know that this is an initial CMS pre go live training session. We will be providing future training sessions as well. We've also been providing some other sessions this week uh, around general functionality, and there's another session that's available tomorrow that I'll highlight on a later screen. Uh, so just want to also make a note that uh, the training will be developed and enhanced as we go forward. Um, we've been working hard racing towards go live. Um, we do expect to have more detailed uh, materials and and be able to provide more um, hands on sessions that will include exercises and whatnot. But we did make a commitment uh, based on past experience and based on where we're at with this project to provide an initial series of go live sessions. So that is pre go live sessions. So that is why we're here today. So uh, we want to give you a sense of the look and feel of the system, some of the base functionality that applies to contractors and allow you to ask some questions uh, at where we're at with the project. So um, I'm Jamie Lozon. I'm the head of the MTO Business Solutions section. So I'm going to be kicking things off today and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague Ryan McCarricker, who some of you may know is um, has been involved in construction with MTO for quite some time and is also quite involved with uh, the previous WBCMS solution and the development of CMS. So I'll just go through a few quick slides here. Just some general housekeeping for today's sessions. Uh, we will be taking questions sort of at the end of each module. So rather than getting too far ahead of the game, try to hold your questions um, and ask them at the appropriate time related to the information that we're going through. Uh, we, we have enabled the chat function to document some questions that way. You can also um, raise your hand at those Q&A opportunities, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible. We will track all the questions that are flagged in the Q&A and try to uh, provide responses to those as, as, as appropriate. Um, like I said, we had a general functionality session on Monday where we had about 700 users, and we received a series of questions, and we'll be looking to make those available to users on our resource site as well. Uh, this is just a little graphic here of in Teams, which I'm I'm sure everyone is pretty familiar with uh, these days over the past couple of years, but you can use the chat feature and the raise your hand. Just a quick overview of CMS. Um, some of you may have been involved in some of the sessions. Some of you, uh, this may be a, an introduction to kind of where we're at with the project. But just uh, to give you a sense, last January we were awarded a contract to KPMG and their partner for, from a technology perspective, Kahua, to replace the existing web-based contract management service uh, that that you'll all be familiar with. Um, so it's it's been a it's been a big project within a tight uh, one-year window. So during that time, we've had several discovery sessions, workshops, configuration sessions, and testing to develop the new solution with the goal of building upon where we're at with WBCMS, um, recognizing that there were lots of lessons learned through that solution and that uh, we've been capturing those lessons learned and wanting to really incorporate those into the new system, take a look at our business practices and processes and looking for areas where we could uh, achieve valuable uh, enhancements to the solution. Um, so we can configured and customized our business processes again where possible um, to make those valuable improvements and Ryan will be able to take you through a lot of those today. Um, so CMS I'm excited to say and, and I'm sure the team can agree with me does go live uh, Monday February the 13th so we're less than a week away um, and again we're committed to these sessions and ongoing sessions there will be tweaking and and obviously um, uh, a lot of a, a little bit of an initial adjustment as we go through the next couple of months, but uh, we, we are really committed to making it a valuable solution and to getting things um, organized before the, the busy construction season. 
Um, just as far as the scope of the new solution, so it, it will handle all construction contracts, uh, material lab contracts and CA agreements like the old system did, but it's also going to have a bit of an expanded scope. It will include um, in phase phasing in design build contracts and CMGC contracts that currently uh, previously weren't in WBCMS. And looking in and around the summer time, time frame, we'll also be incorporating in our engineering planning and design assignments. So that'll be a big added feature for us internally, but also from a collaboration perspective, there's opportunities to more easily share documents as appropriate between the engineering and construction phases, especially for design build contracts. And uh, we're looking forward to having that functionality on our engineering side of the business as well. Um, as for at go live, uh, like I said, it's it's been an ambitious timeline. We have the majority of the business processes and functionality available for day one. However, there are some of the more compl complex and a few of the processes where we're still uh, finalizing and we're hoping to have those ready um, in, in substantial part before the construction season. So uh, we'll work with you if there's anything that is missing. But like I said, the majority of the functionality is there and we are working on future subsequent releases over the spring time frame. Uh, a big question that we have is what happens to the existing contracts and data that's in WBCMS currently? Um, I can confirm that all contracts that are in the current solution are being migrated to CMS. Um, at GoLive, it'll start with the, the priority active contracts that have active construction, followed by those that um, you know, will be starting up in the spring and then the completed contracts after that. So we're kind of doing it in a bit of a phased approach, but we do expect um, to have all the contracts in there and the users onboarded for the respective contracts. Um, so all the data uh, will be housed in the new solution. Obviously, the new solution doesn't look exactly the same as the old solution, so um, there'll be a bit of navigating and we'll provide some, some tip sheets and some information on where to find things, but it generally is fairly user friendly. Um, and also there's a file manager function within uh, CMS similar to the documents folder that was in uh, WBCMS. And that'll be always the place if there's something that didn't fit into a particular location. Um, as a general rule of thumb, you can look in that file manager uh, under that contract that you're associated with. Um, existing users and companies that were in WBCMS will be set up as contact as contacts in the new solution. So that will allow us to easily um, assign users on a per contract basis. That's one of the big changes with the new solution is that um, contractors and CAs and external service providers, you're no longer uh, required to manage your subscriptions. There are no subscription fees. There are still um, limits on the number of users per contract, which are uh, included in the specifications. But um, the ministry will be inviting you to collaborate on active contracts and you will receive um, invitations based on your roles on that contract. So um, we anticipate that that will run smoothly, but again, we'll have to set those up on a per contract basis. And that's part of why we're starting with the priority active contracts. Um, there will be resources available, um, both some within the system, but uh, also through our support line, which we've set up an email, mtocms at ontario.ca. We'll use our existing WBCMS phone support line, will still be available, obviously through COVID and, and with working from different locations. The email is the number one um, choice there, but we'll make sure we're checking messages on the phone line as well. We've also set up, and I'll show you on a, on a next screen, um, a tab on our technical publications website where we can store training materials, user guides, presentations, anything that needs to be communicated related to the system. So we already have some communications that have gone out in the past couple of months uh, loaded up there, and we're looking to add a lot more information on there soon. And there'll also be um, support available directly from KPMG slash Kahua, the vendor. And uh, we're just finalizing that contact information and will be available to users very shortly. 
again, this is just a visual. Um, I'm, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with the MTO Technical Publications site, uh, but you just navigate to the home screen, click on Technical Documents, and then there's a CMS tab store there where we can store, like I said, uh, multiple documents, user guides, that sort of thing. So stay tuned and, and bookmark that page for future resources. Slide here, I think. And I uh, just wanted to also highlight the additional training. So I mentioned the session that we had on Monday um, with uh, about 700 users with uh, Teams, the WIP functionality, the way we have it now, we're allowed um, to have a, a up to a thousand users at these sessions, which is really great. Um, there, we have another general functionality session scheduled for tomorrow. It'll contain some of the similar similar information that we went through today, but um, a little bit more on the general functionality side. So feel free to participate in that if you weren't there on Monday or. Um, or uh, communicate it to others in your organization. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, we also have a similar session as this for the consultant administrators. Um, so that's targeted directly for them. And uh, like I said, we'll have uh, further sessions as we go through the spring as, as required. Um, so the links to those sessions were emailed to all of you, and that's likely how you got to this session today. But they're also available um, as an announcement on our RACS uh, homepage, and there's still opportunity to register from those links there. So I think that was the, the key core messages that I wanted to cover. I'll be in the, the remainder of the session as well, uh, monitoring for questions and helping out Ryan. But um, at this time, I'm going to turn things over to Ryan uh, to go over some of the functionality and to also do some demonstrations where appropriate. So uh, thank you again for attending the session, and we look forward to going live with CMS on Monday. All right, thank you, Jamie. Um, that was a perfect intro. I think everything's covered. We can just talk about, um, you know, the technical training that we're going to go over today. So let's get into it here. Whoops. Wrong slides, good start. There we go. All right, so we're going to talk about change management today, which involves a few different things from the contractor's perspective. So it's daily work records. Um, Ryan, I think which... you uh, need to share your screen. Oh, whoopsie. Thank you. Is that good? Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Right on. OK. OK, take two. So change management, daily work records, uh, time material summary for payment, <clears throat> which obviously DWRs lead to, and then those both stand to serve change orders. Um, what we'll talk about, you know, the four bases of payments of change orders there. Um, talk about contractor quantities, which are, you know, the formerly <clears throat> item postings. It's what the contractors can use to submit their their quantities, um, which are, you know, expected to be weekly based on um, 100 S19, a recent change that we made uh, based on the Construction Act changes for assistance to the CA clause in the general conditions. Um, payments, obviously, which contractor quantities lead to. Um, so we'll talk about reconciling and invoicing, um, and then our information uh, requests and our compensation requests or dispute resolution. Um, each module or each you know section chapter will be appended with uh, a demonstration so i'll go through daily work records and then we'll demo the daily work records tnm and then we'll demo the tnm so we'll go back and forth like that and uh, we'll do questions at the end of each module so if you can please um, hold your questions or put them in the chat and then we'll address them at the end of each module unless there's you know a lot and then we'll uh, we'll take them back and issue the answers after oops OK, so change management. We're going to start with the equipment, labor and material list because we know that's what's required to drive the daily work records. All right, so it, it functions um, largely the same as it does in WBCMS. You're going to have to set them up um, in advance of doing a daily work record. Um, this is how you navigate. I'm not going to show you how to navigate everything in the system, but to start out, this is how the system flows kind of from the left to the right. You start over here in your apps. 
um, and then you can go to all apps. These are different ways to organize um, what you have. So you can organize by administration or cost management, but I typically just go to all apps there. Um, you can see down in the bottom here, let me get a laser pointer. You can see down here, um, if you click this horizontal, it's gonna push all your apps out and you can see every app available to you. Or if you click this vertical, you'll just vertically scroll them in a window here, but you can always keyword search at the top. So you can just scroll there, find your um, app that you're looking for, and then uh, go into it there, or you can always just use a keyword search. Right there. Okay, so this is the equipment list screen when you get to it. Um, right here, you see the you know the number, the asset number. I forgot you can't see my mouse. So right in here, this section, this is called the log view. Um, this is just going to list all the different equipment pieces of equipment that you have in here. Um, and then over here on the right, you see the grid over here where you fill in everything. So you can create. Um, singular pieces of equipment like one offs or you can use the import function if you have a lot. Um, so you just click new and then you come over here and start filling out your grid down here. When you're done, you can either save and close if the equipment's not active yet or it's not on site um, or otherwise if it's active and on site, you just click activate. Alternatively, you can import, um, which is probably a desired feature for most projects that are starting up because you're going to have a lot of pieces of equipment that you want to get in there. So again, like WBCMS, it, it functions very similarly. Um, you're first going to click more and then you're going to export um, a blank template. Uh, that template will be accompanied with whatever you already have input there. So if I were to export this, it's going to have equipment uh, number four through seven in there. You can leave them there. You can delete them, whatever you want. Um, once you click export, it'll just take you to this screen. Just click OK on that one and push it through. Um, and then it'll ask you to save it on your desktop somewhere because you're obviously exporting it. So you save that to a location that you know. And once that opens up, this is what it looks like. So you have some instructions down here on the bottom left. Um, on the tab there, it kind of gives you the breakdown of or the format of how you should be entering the equipment information with some examples on the on the bottom. And then this is what it looks like uh, in the second equipment tab. So you can see those four pieces of equipment are here now, four through seven. Um, they have their asset numbers and everything there, which is great. The stuff over on the left, um, you're going to want to delete that. So that is auto filled by the system. So you just delete that. The system will overwrite it. Um, there's no concerns there. Um, so you can delete that. And then this portion, you don't have to change anything in there. Uh, the system again utilizes that and they will update that. So what you're really looking at is columns I through T. Um, this is where you fill out the asset numbers, description and all the other good information in there. Um, it's really important that you don't alter the the template or the, um, the spreadsheet in any way because the system is basically configured to intake this exact one with those specific cells. They'll take whatever the cells are and put them to the appropriate places in the system. But if that gets changed around, then the system will know what to do with it. So <clears throat> um, this is the new piece of equipment um, that I would use. So this is me filling out. OK, I've got a cat 415 diesel backhoe here. Um, I want that to be added to the projects. So you notice I didn't do anything over here. Just filled in columns I through T. You save it to your desktop again. You can save over the original copy. There's no concerns there. Um, and then you return to CMS to import it. So again, just go to the more and go to the import section. It's going to open up your um, your uh, Explorer again for your desktop. You go to the file that you just saved. So for this one, it's name the file there. Um, and then you just click open or double click the file in the Explorer. You get the same kind of import window again. Just click through that. Um, and then you get this window. So it imports. You can see up at the top, I've got my piece of equipment there. It's equipment number 12 now. Um, you can also see the summary over here. So it says I have now five pieces of equipment. Um, uh, with, a, with a total of 25. So there must be a bunch that are inactive or sitting with the contractor right now that I can't see in this window. There's a new piece of equipment. 
OK, so labor list is largely the same as the labor list. You're going to go to your apps, all apps and then labor list or you know, you can just search labor up in the top there. Um, process is the same. Um, you just export uh, an Excel, you fill in your labors and then you import it again. Um, the one thing that you have to be sure to do, um, the labor type is a little different where in WBC Mass it was one entry, so you would do an entry, a labor type, and that was it. And you had to basically prefix, you know, your company name or whatever. Um, so for this one, we segmented the labor types and the laborers into two different ones. So you can set up generic labor types. You can set up, you know, your company name and then labor, like company name, foreman, company name, operator, whatever it is, subcontractor's name, um, and then when you're creating an actual labor entry, those will manifest as and as options in a drop down list. So you'll click labor type, drop down list will drop down, and then you can choose whichever ones. You don't have to keep typing the names over and over again. Um, you can just recycle the generic types. So there's the type there. Um, those are obviously auto filled by the system, right? Material list is is different. So we've um, We've kind of changed how materialist works from WBCMS. Uh, I don't believe it was correct before. Oh, I might have. Oh, there we go. There it is there. Um, so before uh, the materialist served to produce materials, you had to first put a material in the list in order to reference it in the daily work record, um, which wasn't necessarily appropriate. Um, the, the materials list now in CMS strictly stands to serve the DSM. So any DSM items that you have, you put those in there, uh, it creates a record of it and everything's fine and good. If you have a material for your um, DWR, you're just gonna type the material in. You don't have to create it somewhere else and then reference it. You just type in a box of nails, a tube of epoxy, you know, some glue, whatever it is. Um, you should be, you know, uh, attaching an invoice if you can to the daily work record. If you don't know either um, the material or the invoice at the time of the daily work record, you'll have the opportunity again in the TMSP, which I'll show when we're doing that. Um, you can again just add singular entries in the TMSP, um, type in whatever the material was, attach an invoice, and if the CA agrees, it'll be paid that way. So here's the material list. You can see the DSM number list if you do want to refer to a DSM number list, but you would just be typing that in there. Um, here's a, a list or the sorry, the, the link to the list. Um, so you can reference things right in there or you can add your own external link. And then uh, we'll do a system demonstration of that. Is there any questions first? Let me just. OK, the only questions there seem to be technical difficulties so far, so I'm hoping those folks have figured that out. We did have some issues on Monday that was similar uh, where folks couldn't see the screen and uh, if they logged out and logged back in, it seemed to fix it. I think it's to do with volume. Um, we had 700 people or so on Monday and there's two or 300 people in this one, so hopefully that um, solves things for you. OK, I'm going to move uh, to the demo then. So this is the main screen here, just for the first time we're looking at it. I'm just going to log in. It will remember your login too, so you don't have to uh, type it in every time. This is the landing page you arrive at. Here, I'll zoom in a little bit there. So you see some dashboards here. Um, up here, this is really handy. You've got your, your most recent tasks and your most recent messages. You do have your tasks and your messages over here, so you can always go there to review them, but it gives you a nice little purview at the top there. This is a complete list of tasks, but uh, we covered a lot of that stuff in the general functionality training, and there's another one on uh, Friday, I believe, or Thursday. Um, okay, so we're doing equipment list. Oop. So here's my list here. You can see some more stuff's been added since I made the slides. I'm just gonna go up here and click new. Here's my asset number. Your equipment description. Um, and we need another one. Uh, 
we'll just make that hour. And then make his cat again. 415. Fuel type. You notice most of these aren't necessary, but uh, some of them are. So the rented and the owned, this is necessary for the TMSP. The TMSP needs to know whether it's rented or owned in order to properly uh, calculate the amounts. Um, same with union and non union, union that we'll see for laborers and prime and sub that we'll see for laborers. You can even put an OPS 127 reference in here if you want to support uh, the unit rate of the machine, gross vehicle weight, all that other stuff. Um, assuming things are good, you can upload a picture of it even if you like, or you can just activate it there. It's simple as that. It's now active up at the top here. Okay, I'm just going to jump over to labor now. What's going on here? There we go. So here I have a couple of laborers here. I can do the new. I can come down, choose a labor type. I see carpenter, foreman, and laborer. Those have been set up here in the labor types. So if I want a new labor type, I just create it here. Boo. Save and close that. Now that labor type exists and I can assign any number of actual laborers to that labor type. So if I come over here again, close this one first, reopen it so the new type takes effect, and there you have the skilled labor subcontractor Bob at the bottom. He swings a hammer extremely efficiently. You can put contacts in here too. I encourage you to do so, especially for subcontractors. Um, you can just add them in here um, or add yourselves just if someone needs to get a hold of someone regarding a specific labor, um, particularly maybe a CA who's re reconciling a DWR or something like that. Um, I don't know why they wouldn't assume that you are the contact if you're the contractor PM, but it's always available for you. So same thing there, activate. Now I have my skilled labor, Bob. And when we do daily work records in a little bit, um, we'll be able to select Bob there. Uh, material, I'll just cover that real quickly, but it's basically as simple as the screenshot implied. You're just going to create new. Material name is dirt. Material category, so you can put it into a category if you like here. Just helps sort things a little better. And then all of this is uh, optional except the source ID. Uh, if it's for grading, you're going to have to have a source ID for a pit if you're putting um, gravel in there or whatever. And then color, rate, all that same stuff. Uh, you got the DSM external link here, like I was uh, mentioning. And then when you've got all your rates filled out, you just submit. Oh, source ID, obviously. There we go. OK. On I believe that's it. OK. There were no questions there, I believe. So moving on to daily work records now. So same thing, very similar. You're going to click new. You've got the type of contractor. I was speaking to that before. Remember, you have to select either prime or sub. Um, that's going to tell the system how to how to properly handle it in the TMSP, um, your subject as well. Um, that will be, so when you choose prime, you're going to pop down. I'll show it to you in the, in the, the demo. That'll be your union or non-union. Um, here we go. So you see the link laborers. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Link laborers, and then you have link equipment. And then materials, you notice you just have the insert. So you would just insert a line and type in the material here. The link labors is going to pull up the labor list that we are just reviewing that we added a labor to. And then obviously equipment will do the same thing for the equipment. This is what it looks like. So here I've added a couple of laborers here. And then this is just what I filled out. So you notice right there the name, uh, Jim Dave, and then 
uh, whether they're union or non-union. Now you have to add the name. The name is a requirement because the general conditions definition of a daily work record in, includes the name of the person um, for purposes of, of reconciling the work and the daily work records. Um, so you have to add the name for the person, whether they're union or non-union, and then their hours. And you see the space over here. Let me get my laser pointer again. Over here, there's a blank space, but right here, when this is submitted, it's going to go to the inspector. The inspector is going to fill in their um, hours and comments. So you're going to have contractor's hours and the contractor comments, and then inspector hours and comments. This is the same as when you used to hand a carbon copy daily work record slip to the inspector and they would go through and make comments or scratch out a number, fix it, initial it, whatever, sign it at the bottom. Um, they would turn around and give it to their CA. The CA would then take that, include it with all the other daily work records that relate to that change order work. Um, and then when the TMSP comes in, they're going to use those daily work records to review the hours of the TMSP. Um, so after the inspector inputs their comments and their hours and submits it, it's going to go to the CA. The CA will get their own column here that will show their hours and the comments. And whatever the, the CA's hours are, those will be the hours that are pulled into the TMSP. So every daily work record will have a transparent record of what the contractor's hours were, what the inspectors were, what the CAs were, and then the TMSP will have what was actually paid. It's the same thing for the equipment, I should say, exact same thing. Um, there's notes at the bottom. You can always add a note. Um, night work premiums may apply, whatever you want to, you know, convey to the CA in case they may not understand an hour or, uh, you know, whatever, a piece of equipment, whatever it may be. Um, you can see at the bottom or at the top, I've got my materials here. So I've input, you know, just I needed some nails and epoxy and I needed some lumber. I must have had to form something extra that, you know, we weren't aware of maybe. Um, and then attachments at the bottom. Oh, always, you know, obviously support your materials and anything else you may be submitting with an invoice or receipt or any, something to, to support it. So there's your material there, your notes, and then your upload. Okay, so this I already went over, the reconciliation portion. So you can see there, there's the inspector and then the CA comments, and then the CA inspector comments and inspector and CA comments. So they obviously agreed with the bottom two, and then the inspector made a slight correction to the foreman uh, amounts from five hours down to four, and the CA agreed with it. I guess the foreman left for lunch. You got that there, and then you've got here for the equipment, and you've got the materials here. And then, yeah, just again, the amounts that are shown in the CA's entries in the final columns on the right will be what's pulled into the TMSP. Uh, please note the inspector is still required to receive and retain the hard copy of the material weight ticket. Um, so it's mostly a message for our inspectors, but um, please don't assume that you can just throw those out or keep all three copies. We still need a copy and we still require the CAs to give us those hard copies at the end. We got ourselves another system demonstration of daily work records here. So just back out of this. Go back to my apps here. I'm just going to search daily. I'm going to click new. Now, what's the first thing we have to do with any daily work record is link it to either um, a change order or a uh, compensation request because they have to relate to either a request for a change or a change. So right off the bat, is it a prime or subcontractor? We'll go sub. He's a subcontractor, and then this is related to a compensation request. So you notice compensation request, and then you get a drop down for CRs, and a list of all the submitted CRs will be here. Now you can't, because this is a required field, you won't be able to um, submit a CR, or sorry, submit a daily work record without submitting a CR. The CR doesn't have to be completed. It doesn't have to, you don't have to have it uh, you know, a disposition provided back to you on it. You just have to fill it out, submit it, and then you can immediately 
um, take daily work records against it, which is as per the general conditions um, and the SPs that amend it to catch it up with the Construction Act changes. So here's my CR. If I change this to change order, here you can see I have my change orders here. So let's say we're doing some exploratory digging. Come down here, here's my sections. You can also over here on the right, if I pop all these out, I'm going to run out of space vertically. So you can see I've got a lot to scroll now, but you can just jump down um, to whatever sections you want. Uh, just like that. OK, so here we'll link labors. There they are there. Oh, no, we're doing Bob today. There's Bob. Ironically, despite his company name, it's actually William, but he goes by Bill. He did eight hours, great work in his backhoe. Maybe he also had testing upload equipment. <laughs> you can tell this is my contract that I used to test our system. So downtime was zero, standby was zero, but he was working five hours. Zero, zero, six hours. Materials, some donuts, baker's dozen each. They were used donuts, but somehow they were $50. And then you've got your upload here. It's just going to open up your um, your Windows Explorer there. Uh, let's see. Let's do a picture. Yeah, whatever. And then submit that. There we go. It's submitted. If you look at the status, you can see the ball in court is with me, which is a little misleading. I should have said um, for the purpose of these demos, um, I have made myself um, each and every role you see down on the bottom right here. I just got a, uh, a notification. So this is me as the CA or the inspector. Sorry, getting a notification on my screen saying, hey, someone just submitted a daily work record to you. Come on, there we go. So you can see this is our roster role. This is all the different roles that are on a project. I've just assigned myself to all of them. So it kind of jumps around a little bit. I'll when we do change management, I'll explain, you know, I'm in now as the CA, I'm in now as the contractor. Um, and then yeah, that's all there is to it for daily work records. So is there any questions? I know that there is, so let me let me look at a few of these here. Will existing oh that's rec answered. Will the contractor see the inspector's hours and notes when submitted to the CA? Um, I believe so. Yes, um, they're going to see it regardless when it comes in, and they would see it when the CA is marking it up with a pen and and you know signing it in the field. Um, in addition to what the previous question was, will a contractor have the ability to challenge the contents of the RDW if it is not in alignment with the hours? So this question comes up a lot. Um, there is no business process to challenge a daily work record other than a compensation request. Um, if I qu quickly flip here, I'll just jump ahead in the demo. I won't go through it, but just to answer this question, this is the contractor creating a new one. An unresolved change order price negotiation according to GC 3.10.01 changes in the work. So that is your avenue to dispute um, payment for a change order related right down to the granular level of an entry in a daily work record. So there is and always has been a process, but it's not in daily work records. It's in our dispute resolution process. Was the change order field mandatory for input in the DWR? Yes, it is. Yeah, you have to link it to either a change order or a compensation request. Now, if you submit a compensation request and it results in a change order, you can submit a compensation request and begin taking daily work records against that CR immediately. If, you know, two weeks from then a change order comes out and it's issued to you and it's finalized and you accept it, you can then start taking daily work records against the change order. 
when you reconcile or, or generate the TMSP, it's going to pull in this, the daily work records that are linked to both the CR and the change order. So it's going to catch it all up for you. Um, and then you also have the ability to add one-off daily work records in the TMSP that will go over, I believe it's next. Um, notifications do go to your email, yes. So I've been getting email notifications for the actions that I've been taking throughout this. Um, they don't do it for each and every single thing, I believe, but for the most part they do, uh, particularly if it's sitting with you. So the emails and the notifications are subject to workflow actions. So if I send something to you directly and it's waiting on you for action, then um, you will get an email. If you're not part of the process, but you would like to know, um, the user is able to input your contact as a distribution list. It's kind of like carbon copying someone on the submission of of a record and you'll get an email that way. This just requires manual uh, manipulation by the user. So someone may ask you, a CSA may ask you, hey, when you submit compensation requests, can you please put me in the distribution list so they get notified at the same time as the CA? Uh, why is the labor rate shown included when f filling out a DWR? I didn't see that. I believe it's because if it's not input, it's not a mandatory field. Um, so if it's not input at the labor portion, then you can input it at the individual daily work record portion. This arrow here too, you can always pop this open and open in an individual field. Yeah, so there's the rate. Um, so you can input the rate there. And if we go back to the labor list, you'll see that the rate isn't mandatory. Um, maybe we should make it mandatory, but we're trying to allow flexibility in the system. So whereas previously it rigidly said you must have a rate and you can't enter a DWR without the rate, um, you know, it's a, it's it's kind of trying to make things more flexible here. So if for some reason there's a labor entry that you want in there that doesn't have a rate, um, or maybe you don't know it at the time, maybe it's a subcontractor and you don't have the rates yet, but you're setting them up in the system, you can make them in here and then later supplement the, the rate in the daily work record. Um, can a mock project be available? Unfortunately not. Um, that's a common question too as well. Um, we are still in the testing stages. Um, you know, we're going live, but we're in the, you know, in the extremely final stages of testing, but we, we don't have the ability to create the amount of contracts that we would. Um, you know, if we created one contract and gave it out to 500 users, it would crash pretty quickly because everyone would be acting as the same person in there. It just wouldn't work. And, you know, conversely, we can't have 500 contracts you know, set up for testing. Um, it's it's difficult for you even, you know, getting the uh, exercise contracts for such large groups like today and we had Monday. So unfortunately that's not in the cards at, at this time. Only Sierra can challenge reconciliation noted, but somewhat unfair to contractor that there is no red flag or indicator within the software system. So the, this, so another principle that we have undertaken in the development of this is not to prescribe, teach, and control every single step of, of people. Your main instruction manual, so to speak, is the general conditions and the contract, and it's very clear there um, what the processes are and what you should and shouldn't be doing and what you should look for. Um, so our system only stands to administer and employ the business processes laid out by our general conditions and the various clauses in our SPs that compile the contracts. If an RFC has been submitted, um, but a CO has not been issued, how would the contractor go about tracking their work? So RFCs are will not be uh, persisting in CMS, but if we're talking about compensation requests, uh, the contractor submits a compensation request. That's all they have to do. So they can link it immediately to the compensation request. And when a change order is later created, um, those daily work records will be pulled forward to the change order. So all you have to do is submit the CR, as per the general conditions, and then you can take daily work records. Will the rates adjust for premium overtime? No, they won't. It would be nice, um, but we don't know what the adjustments are, right? They're different for each contractor, so it's it's on the onus of the contractor. 
um, they could set up a base rate in their labor list. And then if that same laborer is uh, performing premium night work, they would override that rate in the daily work record um, because you can use the, the rate section in the daily work record and the labor. So they would update it with the updated price. And I would hope um, they would add a little comment to kind of like I had in my example, just stating, you know, this is premiums for nighttime work. Can daily work records be backdated or do they require? So there's no timeout time. Um, they don't have to be done within a 24 hour period or anything. Um, they do have to be taken. I mean, again, referring to the general conditions and the business practice, they are to be taken and submitted diligently. Um, it's going to be up to the CA. Um, but you, you should be taking daily work records and submitting them as soon as possible. I understand, obviously, that's not realistic. When you finish a 14-hour shift digging a hole somewhere, you don't want to go do paperwork the next day, the day after, whatever. But you, it's it's more of a question for your CA, really, than it is for me. Um, the system won't restrict you on a, on a basis of time at all. And then for contracts operating on the old GCs, will CRs be available to them? So if it's the old GCs, it would be the RFCs that they would be operating with, which will not be available to them. Um, we have risk managed that and identified the very few contracts that are still persisting with the um, previous dispute resolution process. Um, so the RFCs will not be available in CMS. Does the IR still have to be created to link the CR and then daily work records get linked to IR? Or do you simply submit CR with requested dollar? So there never was a requirement to link IRs and CRs. Um, they enact different business processes. IR is just the benign questions. Um, you know, I need information on this. What size bolt goes here? You didn't indicate it. What type of weld is this? It's missing the diagram. Um, and then the CR is obviously a perceived uh, need for uh, additional compensation. OK, I'm going to move on to the next module here. Good question, so. Okay, continuing with change management, now we're going to get into our time material summary for payments. Okay, so we're going to navigate to the TMSP app again, um, click new. Over here, you notice the type of contractor again, that's going to be related to the prime sub that you indicated on each daily work record. So that's where that calculation comes in, and then you also have the change order field there. Now you notice you don't have the CR field anymore because this isn't a daily work record. DWRs can be linked to CRs or change orders, but only um, change orders can have TMSPs created for them. A TMSP is essentially the price agreement for a change order. Price agreement dictates what basis of payment will be, so you sign it saying you'll do it by TNM, but you only have an estimate at the time. Um, so the TMSP uh, basically comes in at the end to substitute and become the final price of the change. Um, important note here, so this is a huge improvement that we have for time and material. We, we have overhauled change management uh, completely uh, to hopefully introduce many efficiencies for all stakeholders that I'm pretty excited about as a stakeholder myself. Um, so for TNM work, um, we had issues before we couldn't separate prime and subcontractors. We couldn't separate union and non-union. We couldn't progressively pay. So uh, TMSP or time material change orders that span uh, invoice periods, we couldn't pay those without having to close the change order and create a new one. So that's solved. We can pay as many as we want. Um, and we can also, if the TNM or TM, TMSP comes in higher than the original estimate, um, we can recirculate that change order for DOA without having to cancel it. So all of those things were not possible in WBCMS. There's just a lot more of the flexibility that we've instilled into the design for this system, particularly change management. So if you have prime contractors and subcontractors on the same uh, TNM change order, you would just simply create two TMSPs. You'd create one for your prime. It's only going to pull in the prime entries that were related specifically to that change order or CR. And if you're going to pull in your subs, and it'll only pull in the subs. Oh, 007, I didn't even realize that. So this change order seven's been issued to the contractor. It's paid by T&M. Um, right there, you can see the basis of payment by time material as per the general conditions of contract. 
um, and then you just have to submit your estimate. So we know that when a, a T and M change order is first issued to you, you don't you don't have the final exact cost. You don't have the TMS or DWRs. You just have your estimate. So you're going to submit your estimate as a lump sum. You're going to support it with supporting documentation if you have some, uh, and any comments that you have as well. So after completing the general section, section you click daily work records or link daily work records. Sorry, right there. Um, this is obviously going to bring up uh, your daily work records here. So this is every daily work record that is linked or associated to the change order. So you don't necessarily have to pull them all in. If you made an erroneous one or you've agreed, OK, no, that work isn't part of that. Maybe it's part of a different change or maybe it's item work, whatever it is. You select which ones you want to to actually pull in. Um, this one gets me every time it took me a little bit. You can't click on the actual. Um, uh, whatever you call this, <laughs> the log entry, you have to click a toggle here because it's set up for multi-select. So you can select a bunch if you want. Here's the change order section. So I said, okay, it's a prime. This is just my example here, prime. And then here's my change orders um, right here. This would be a bigger list if you know if we were further into the contract. Um, and then your daily work records here. So this is where you can link individual daily work records. Like I said, if there's a one off thing um, that you missed or yeah, you go back, add another one and then link it in there. The notes. So here's the materials grid again. You've got your notes here. You can insert it. Um, any materials in here should be supported by an invoice. There may be scenarios where it's not, but generally that should be the case. Um, when it's completed, you can click submit or you can click save and it auto calculates here. So this will show you um, the total of the TMSP, just the individual one, not the total one. Um, once it's reviewed, uh, the TMSP is pulled into the invoice and it sits there and waits. So that's how we're able to accomplish progressive payments without changing it. You can send the TMSP to the invoice without finalizing the change order. They stand alone, even though they're related and linked. So is there any questions on that? I don't see any. That's good news. We'll do a system demo again. Actually, I want to switch these. Oops. OK, time and material. Back to our apps again. Time material summary. I'm just going to click new. <clears throat> Here's my type of contractor, subcontractor, change order. Oh, no, I think it was number six. See if we can pull Bob in here. I don't think it's reconciled, so I won't be able to pull him in, but that's okay. Yeah, there's no value to it yet there. So I'm just going to go up if you ever want to edit something. So this is in save right now, but if I just want to edit up here, I just click at it. Come back down. I forgot to link Bob in. Oh, there's nothing. Yeah, I didn't link Bob to the change order, so. Uh, maybe I can do it here. No. Nope. OK, so if that. Let's see if a different change order. I won't waste too much time on this, but. See if anything else has uh, daily work records linked to it. No, it doesn't look like it. Anyway, that's where you'd select them. And then you just save here and it updates right here, just as it showed in the um, slideshow. And then I showed this, I believe, prime sub. Yep. OK. Couple questions here. How do you create a TNM summary with both a prime and a sub together? So you don't do that. You're just going to create two separate TMSPs. There's unlimited amount of links um, as far as TMSPs to change orders. So you would create one for a prime, one for a sub. Uh, the payroll burden is entered in the TMSP. Or no, sorry, it's entered at the labor entry stage, I believe. Let's go back and check that. Yeah, it's entered in here. 
in the TMSP. So you click save, it generates everything, and then you've got your, you know, this looks largely like the old um, time material summary for payment Excel sheet. And then you just put your actual payroll burden in here, whatever you want, 80%, and then make sure you've got your letter from the Ministry of Finance, I believe, and your CTF um, submitted to the CA. Uh, what is the process if TNM change order cost goes above the original? So you would just go to the change order and then recirculate. Um, the we set up the DOFMA process for change orders um, to be manually driven. So when you set up a change order um, and create it, uh, it works a lot like CAS did back in the day in the paper-based day. So internally, um, the initiation app, app in change order, which only CAs and CSAs will see, um, that's going to be where you set up your base of payments, you add the value, your tender items, uh, you obtain DOFMA, and then you issue it out. Um, but when you try and issue it out, there's issue and there's initiate DOFMA buttons. And if you try and issue or submit without initiating DOFMA, even if it's within your own um, DOA, uh, the system will prevent you. So you have to click initiate DOFMA. Um, so in the case of a TMSP exceeding the initial um, estimate, you would just click that button again or revise your estimate. You click revise, put in whatever the new amount is. The system will identify it's one penny or more higher than the original estimate. And then you click initiate DOFMA, it'll circulate it up. And then your change order is now caught up again to the TMSP amount. And the actual portable form that's displayed and emailed out for that DOFMA process is our old COACE form, the change order approval cost estimate form. Okay, move. Oop, I just stopped sharing. Moving on here. Okay, change orders. Okay, so change orders are part of the change management suite. We've created the change management suite um, to house all commercial activity. There's several benefits we uh, realize as an owner, and I think our CAs and our contractors will realize as well. Um, as it's kind of a one-stop shop for all uh, changes or basically any commercial activity uh, that happens on the contract. So that's change orders, change proposals, compensation requests, and other payment adjustments. Um, the change order process in CMS now mirrors the business process. So I spoke to this a bit already. So you've got the CA creating an internal initiation. Um, they're going to garner their DOFMA. Everything's going to be ready to go. When they click issue, the contractor has one change order form come to them. It looks exactly like our old change order form, um, the PHCC form. Uh, they fill out their estimate, submit it back to us. That um, That's equal to signing and returning it. Uh, we're talking about an extra work change order here or a change in the work. Um, then the next thing that happens is the price agreement comes out. So if your estimate's higher than the CAs and they agree on it, they're going to internally go and get more DOFMA, and then they're going to issue back to you the price agreement with the revised amount. Um, the change order will be signed, the price agreement will be signed, and that's all there is to it. So as far as the contractor is concerned, a happy path would be receiving a change order, filling in your estimate, signing it and sending it back, receiving a price agreement, reviewing the estimate, signing it and sending it back. That's as simple as that. That's two steps. Oh. OK. So here again is your change order grid. Um, if a revision is requested, you can always put a comment at the top. Uh, not always, you're going to have to. So see at the bottom here, there's submit estimate. This is a change order that has been sent to the contractor. It's fresh. You can see there's a tender item variation there uh, for item number 31, subcode 1, and then also a lump sum element to it, which is not filled out. Um, so if you request revision, the system's going to say if you're sending it back because you want to have something added or there's a mistake or an omission or you disagree with the price, you have to click uh, request or, or you have to fill out a comment and then request revision. Don't just send it back without anything. You have to send back with some context because the expected you know, action is that you're going to sign it. So if you're 
performing an unexpected action, you have to provide context to it as well. Uh, the tender item quantity section is where you input both the, the tender quantity adjustments and the item prices. So we're talking base of payment method A and base of payment method B. If they're both selected, um, you're going to have two fields in there that are editable, the quantity and the price. If only A is selected, you're only going to be able to edit the quantity. And if only B is selected, you're only going to be able, able to edit the price. I believe for the purpose of this one, I did both. So you can edit both the price and the quantity. Um, and then the lump sum section at the bottom there. So you can see in the total with the dollar sign, that's where I should have put it. I think I just forgot to put it in there when I issued it. So if this was a real life scenario, you'd probably say request revision. You forgot the lump sum amount, dummy. Uh, when it's complete, you just submit the estimate there at the bottom, which is the same as signing the estimate and submitting or signing the change order and submitting the estimate. Sorry. You also get some notifications here, so some questions have, have come up about that. This, I, you know, we've already seen this uh, no little notification that happens in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Um, and then over here in the bottom right, you've got the uh, that's my just my generic outlook pop up that comes up. Uh, you know, it said Ryan has uh, sent a change order to me for DOFM approval. So this would be me as a CSA. Um, but anyone, like I said, with an act uh, workflow action is going to receive the same notifications. So the contractor has three options once the price agreement is presented to them. Um, again, you can request revision. This is kind of the negotiation piece or the, hey, CA, you forgot this or what's up with this. Um, if you accept it, obviously that's just signing it and then it's going to be completed. Um, whatever changes are within the contract will enact or within the change order will en enact against the contract. Um, and then there's undisputed amount. So the undisputed amount won't do anything different system wise as clicking accept, um, but it's kind of it's a twofold. It's it will record to the record that the contractor accepted this but didn't agree with the price, um, which doesn't necessarily speak to our business. But I think we're all aware when you don't agree with the price. Um, the other piece is it's kind of prompting a contractor to be like, accept the undisputed amount and submit a CR because we get a lot of back and forth and back and forth. And if you can't negotiate the price, you know, there's that's what dispute resolution is for. So it's just kind of prompting uh, a reminder that that avenue is there. Obviously, we don't want to push people into a million CRs, but if there's a disagreement that, you know, can't find a resolution, that is the process. So down here, those are the buttons we're talking about. You can always save it and review for later as well. So is there any change management questions? Uh, DOFMA, sorry, that is, so that's kind of an internal MTO thing. So it's delegation of financial management authority. Um, we as civil servants um, only are allowed to approve certain levels of financial change based on delegated authority down from the Minister of Transportation. So as a CSA, I have an amount of 25,000, the CAs have 15,000, our area managers have 100, blah, blah, blah. So it's basically the larger the value, the higher up the chain it has to go for approval, which is why large value change orders take long to approve because they have to go up through several people and several stages of review. Uh, is the invoicing process in CMS the same or similar to that in the WBCMS? Yeah, yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. But uh, don't get ahead of yourself, uh, Omar. We're getting there. Um, I think that's one of the last ones, but we'll talk about that for sure. Um, what is DOF? Oh, I already read that one. DOA amounts got changed recently. What are the new values? Um, I don't have them on me. I have a list. Um, they're higher. I can say that. Um, they should uh, they should allow the field level staff to certainly handle a lot more day to day benign changes uh, a lot quicker. So that's good. But um, yeah. Okay. Oh, no, I already did change orders. Contractor quantities. Okay, so I spoke to contractor quantities before as well. Um, this is kind of a term that we, I'll say it, we made it up, uh, <laughs> but it is what they are. Uh, it hails from 100 S19, which modifies the GCs. Uh, which is that con assistance to this contract administrator clause. It basically just says the contractors to submit um, a summary of their quantities 
uh, on a weekly basis. So this is just in an effort to help payments go quicker, help the reconciliation process be quicker and better. So if you're submitting small portions of your quantities throughout the month versus dumping a whole bunch of them at the end of the month and then having to go back and forth with the con or the CA about four weeks worth of um, postings instead of one week each, right? Um, so this is just kind of set up in alignment with that general condition 7.01.06. Uh, amendment, I should say. The grid's very brief. Um, this is very similar to um, a lot of other basic submissions. Um, you've got your from two dates here. Uh, you can, so the period start and end, this is one difference from WBCMS. The from date used to be auto filled with the to date of the previous one. That's no longer the case. You can go back as far as you want, doesn't matter. Um, we are able to audit in different ways, so we don't really have to rely on that to track our quantities anymore because we have far better uh, tracking systems. So uh, your period start and end date is completely up to you, um, particularly if it's, you know, the Monday to the Friday or, oh, I did some Sunday work that I forgot, whatever it is. Um, this change order piece, just disregard this. I believe this is going to be removed. Um, this is something that we had remnant of how we were going to intake change orders into the invoice, um, but just leave that blank for now. You should be able to select them in the contractor quantities down here. This is where you're going to get the meat and the potatoes of your submission. So you've got your items, your subcodes. Um, the system does track things by subcodes now. It intake quantities by subcodes, which is great. Um, it's a good level of detail for both parties. Um, change orders as well can now adjust subcode levels. So if there is one subcode subcode amount that's off, we can adjust that subcode amount, which is as per the business. Again, references down here, photos, whatever you want, um, whatever you want to to support things there. This is what the contractor quantities grid looks like when you um, pop pop it out full screen. So you've just got, you insert as many rows as you want. Um, if you're doing 10 items, you're gonna insert 10 rows. Uh, you're just gonna choose your item number, your subcode. Um, the date of work is gonna uh, be pre-filled with your from to date there, and then your payment quantity, and that's all you need. You can add comments again as well. We always love context. It's, it's great for accountability and auditability and knowing what's going on. So um, encourage that. This is kind of a brief module. Um, is there any questions with that? Do contractor quantities need to be submitted every week or can they be done once a month? So if we're talking need, technically from a system standpoint, they don't need to ever be submitted all but once, but contractually you are compelled to do so on a weekly basis. There it is. The contractor shall submit quantities of work completed to the CA on a weekly basis as a minimum to facilitate reconciliation of quantities of work completed. So there's your there's your answer. Since the system tracks at the subcode level, will the CA be able to create new subcodes for item adjustments? Uh, yes, I believe so. How subcodes will work for existing contracts. OK, so for so for existing contracts, we won't have the subcodes. It's going to be the same as WBCMS. WBCMS really only tracked and paid at the item level. Um, you were inputting into certain subcodes in your item postings, but that was simply a user interface. The system wasn't intaking that intelligently and sorting and tracking things by subcodes. It would only ever roll it up to a total. Um, so because that functionality doesn't exist in WBCMS, we are unable to migrate that functionality into CMS. It only exists in CMS, so there's basically no way other than a complete manual exercise to create tens of thousands of subcodes for 52 contracts that we're migrating over. So unfortunately, no subcodes or sub codes for the migrated contracts, but every single new contract in CMS going forward for years um, we'll have the full functionality, obviously. OK. Reconciliation. Did we submit a quantity? I can't remember if we submitted one last time. Let's do one quickly. We need something to reconcile here. So we'll go first, 
to the eighth. No, ignore that. Let's expand this. I never did my demo. Sorry about that. Let's do these three. So here your item number. You can scroll through here. I think this item has about 150 contracts. You can see it scrolls nice and quickly. Um, or you can just search. Uh, let's go 120. Item 123. Maybe there isn't one. Let's go item 12. There it is. TAC code. And then we have all our subcodes here. We haven't included the descriptions of the subcodes along with it because just due to real estate, um, but you have your cue sheets which do uh, correlate to each subcode. Um, so the location is down the left hand column of the cue sheet as they correspond to the horizontal columns which have the items and the item variations. Um, these locations down the side are the subcodes. Um, so those descriptions. So the first one and the first description would relate to subcode one. Come down here. Let's do some granular A here, supported by some tickets, subcode 22. You can see the location does pop in here. When you click it, you just can't have it available to select it. So you can kind of do a guess and check thing too, if you like. Let's do some super pave, 35. There you go, 18 plus 722, perfect. And then my payment quantity over here. So this is just on the subcode, so remaining subcode quantity, revised subcode quantity. So this would be if it's been changed or, you know, any change orders or OPAs to this would be affecting this. So you're seeing the total here. So I'm just going to lop off 500 from there. Let's lop, lop off 827 and 365. We'll leave one. And we'll submit that. There's no reconciliation required for contractor quantities. Um, well, there is, but the CA does it later. It's not like a daily work record where the inspector and the CA reviews it. Once it's in, it's in. Uh, that should be it. So you can see this here on the bottom, ready for reconciliation, ready for reconciliation. And you can see this middle one, it's tied up in a reconciliation currently. I think we have some more questions. Is this for new contracts, the SSP referred to? Uh, no, I believe, I'm not sure when it was made active, but the date is January 2023, and this is replacing one um, from 2021, I believe. So um, if this con, if this spec is referenced in your contract, then uh, it will be. And it's probably referenced. I don't think they would regurgitate this whole thing in the specs. They will probably just reference it in the big grid uh, in the, the front end of your tender package where it lists all the different OPSs and SSPs. Uh, we typically do that with standard stuff. This is, you know, when you're modifying the GCs, it's a little different, but I don't think we typically put these things in unless they are new. So I'm not 100% sure on that, but I think it's it's very likely. Plus, um, this is a January 2023 one, which all that has done is is make the uh, we 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 massage the language a bit there. But the previous one also required weekly submissions of of quantities by the contractor. So I think regardless, unless you're in a very old contract, it's going to apply to you. Uh, uh, can the contractor input quantities above the existing quantity of a subcode before a change order is made? To, yes, they can. Yep, it still only tracks that at the ten at the tender item level, so you can override a subcode. Um, but the expectation would be if it's persistent and substantial, a change order would be done. Personally, I don't care if it exceeds by one or two, because typically the next one will go under and over under. But it's really for the CA to manage. So, can we access all ongoing? current projects under one login? Yes, you can. So the way access works is it's based on your contract status with the ministry. So if you have a contract with the ministry that is between award and for our contractor's sakes, between ward, uh, award and warranty release, you'll have access to that contract. If you have two or three or four contracts that are within those two statuses, you'll have access to those, all four within one login. Um, it's based on your user profile, which is based on your username because MTO is covering the cost of the licenses. It's not per contract, per user, per year. We're 
before we had to prescribe that in order for the vendor to actually know how much they were going to get paid and know if they was even viable, you know, as a corporation uh, to undertake our project. Now that whole requirement is gone. So um, the access is a lot, um, it's a lot better. Conversely though, if you don't have any active contracts with the ministry, you will not have access to the system or any of your past contracts. And for each contract, you're pretty much going to lose access to that contract um, if you don't have any at work with the ministry anymore. Is it possible to compile all the items and subcodes in Excel and import it into CMS? Um, no, but I'm not. I'm unsure why you would want to do that. Um, the items are all in here already. So if it's the case of uh, basis of payment B where you're introducing a new item, um, you're going to click while well, you're going to go to the SOV and you're going to add that item. And what that is going to do is draw on the CPS master item list um, with the item codes. And yeah, that's 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 basically it. You just go add the item and then you can add into the change order. But as far as importing it, no, um, we want the items to always correlate to their item code because an item can have a different tender item depending on what order it gets put in a contract, but its item code will always be the same. So from a reporting standpoint and from an integration standpoint with our contract preparation system, um, it has to it has to be referencing our internally managed uh, item list. So no import export for items. Uh, for item posting, they're called pay statements now. <laughs> can you and contractor quantities? Can you export and import for faster entry? No, unfortunately, and maybe that's what Mina was getting at as well. Apologies if that's what you were getting at, Mina. But um, for for Nicholas, no, you can't import at all. It's it's one by one. Again, because um, you know the, the same thing. The item numbers are different each time and different quantities and everything. So we're trying to keep things holistically in the system. You might have already mentioned this. Um, can you copy previous DWRs from previous days? Uh, no, actually um, not at the time. That's a good idea though. We can add that to a list, but no, not at this time. If completed contracts, but we claim still ongoing, can we have access to it? Um, that's a good question. We would probably leave it in a status where you would have access to it. We just wouldn't put it into the for final release. Um, so yeah, that would be a, That'd be what I would do as a CSA. I would just keep it because it's a manual driven process to put it from warranty into uh, warranty. I forget what we called it, final completion or something like that. Um, but yeah, we would just we would just have to keep that one open for you. We won't hide files. OK, I think we're good to go there. OK, reconciliation. It's actually pretty easy and I got about 10 minutes left and then we'll do Q&A. So I think we're good on. Oops, we're on track here. Uh, I keep reverting. <laughs> OK. Reconciliation. OK, it is pretty straightforward. Um, one, I think, pain point that we've solved for contractors, which is a stupid little thing, but I think you're going to like it a lot. Um, OK, so well, the CA will prepare the reconciliation and send it to the contractor just like previously. Uh, the contractor has to acknowledge those items in the box, and if you don't acknowledge the items, they don't get pulled in to the invoice. Now, my big improvement is it's autofilled. So if you have 65 items, um, they are all automatically going to be filled, assuming you want to intake them and you need to cognitively go out of your way to uncheck something. Um, if you don't want to pull it into the invoice, maybe you don't agree with the price of the item anymore due to conditions when you showed up. But um, yeah, any items that are not pulled in um, or not acknowledged will not be pulled in. Um, that is literally all I have for the reconciliation just because it's that straightforward. So I'd rather just show you the demo. Um, we'll go through questions after. 
and I don't see any anyway. Oh, someone has their hand up. Yeah, Piero, do you want to ask a question? Just unmute yourself. We can't hear you, Piero. I think he might have lowered his hand, Ryan. Probably good. Oh, OK. All right, if it comes up, just throw it in the chat. Uh, can a payment pull in multiple reconciliations? Yes, yeah, we'd uh, we'd be against our own requirements if you couldn't, right? Because you invoice once a month, then you reconcile or you submit quantities four times a month. So, yep, reconcile as much as you want and then invoice and it will pull all reconcile uh, completed reconciliations in. So here we are, we have our contractor quantities. Just going to go again to the apps. You can see why I didn't include this in every single slide. It gets pretty repetitive, but that's good. It should be easy to use. Um, we're just going to create a new one here. You can see I have a couple open ones, and then one is pending acknowledgement. So I've sent one to the contractor. Um, actually, that was today. So I'm just going to do another one because I believe we just posted three more, right? So I know they were for February 1st to February 8th. Choose a contractor here. Boom. That's me. Save and close. And this is sorry, I should say this is the CA creating this right now, so you guys won't see this. Um, this is the CA just setting the dates and then issuing this. So I'm going to submit this to the contractor. I should likely get a task. There it is right there. We can flip to my emails really quick. Don't read any. Here you can see contractor quantity, contractor quantity. Contractor here, DOFMA approval process. So I'm getting emails for all this stuff. Um, OK, so this is sitting with the contractor right now. Blip, blip, blip. Now I'm the contractor. You can see I have acknowledged down here. I'm just going to pop this and there's my. My checks right there so I can uncheck them. I can keep them checked, but if you just ignore them, you'll get paid. So I acknowledge this. You can see the subcodes are there too, sorry. And that's it, reconciled. Here's another one that's pending our acknowledgement. Let's do this one too, and we can get an invoice going here. I'll show those subcodes again. So you can see here when you break it out, you get some really good detail. There's your acknowledgements, your items, and your subcodes. So you got your name, item description, your item number, the subcodes here, the location of the subcodes, and then what's been in here. So. Looks like we're doing 122 and 1. Right on. Acknowledge those. OK, we're ready for the invoice demo. I think I just have a couple slides on invoice too. Questions. Are you able to reconcile more than once per day? Oh, you're right. I never even thought about that. WBCMS had a limitation, um, but I I believe that is not the case anymore because the limitation technically and logically that drove that limitation from WBCMS's configuration was that from to thing. So the from date was always appended to the previous reconciliations to date. So if it was the seventh, this one's the eighth. I can only ever choose the eighth. Um, which I believe if you did the 8th that day and it's still the 8th, the system won't let you do another one on the 8th. It has to wait until it's the 9th or greater. Um, otherwise, it'll consider it to be the same day and it, it would it just didn't work. So with this one, you should be able to do as many as you want because the dates um, are manually input by the user, um, so it shouldn't restrict you. Uh, if it does come up, let me know and we'll, we'll look at that and fix it, but that should be the case. Will the reconciliation post by subcode? WBC, yes, so it is by subcode. So you post them by subcode, we track them by subcode, they're displayed in the reconciliation by subcode there. Will CMS have the same three levels of access as WBCMS had, and will we be required to have one of each per contract? So no, um, WBCMS set permissions based on groups of users and forced business users to be in one of those three groups, um, whereas in this case we have what's called a user permissions matrix, which basically means every single user in our entire organization and every single one of our stakeholders through all engineering firms, construction contra contractors, and otherwise, every single role has 
a unique permission to every single app and business process. So we have uniquely defined permissions to all aspects of the system. Um, so for contractors, you have two. So not to say that it's, you know, the whatever it was, inspector, CA and RCA or whatever it was, but uh, we just created a contractor tech and a contractor PM. The tech being theoretically, it's probably going to be like the QC guy uh, or person who's taking and submitting samples and, uh, and they would have access to that. Whereas the PM is going to have access to more of the commercial stuff and a larger uh, array of apps. Um, so if you have a helper or a tech or whatever, uh, you give them just the cute or the contractor tech. Um, but as long as they're, you know, as long as you trust them to do whatever else in the system, you just give them the contractor role. Where do inspectors put item postings? Um, inspectors put item postings, so they're pay statements now. Um, uh, our business has always called them pay statements, so they will be done in the diaries, which is also as per the business. How long will the contractor have access after the warranty period to each project? So you lose access upon final completion. So when warranty is released, that would be the cutoff time. Okay, invoicing. So, oh, there's a spelling mistake. Invoice sizing is mostly automated based on the other administrative actions taken in the system. So based on approved change orders, OPAs that have been processed by the CA, you know, claim payments or settlements that have been accepted, ERS adjustments, that kind of stuff. Same as WBCMS, it functions largely the same. It's basically completely automated, save for the dates. Um, invoices uh, will produce a complete report. Uh, however, so we've bolstered that um, a little bit in the system. So you're going to see the general section here and then you get the section A, B, C, um, you get everything there. So it all kind of filters down. There wasn't much in this invoice, but it gives a great level of detail. Um, and that was it for invoices. I'm just going to do the demo now. We have a couple reconciliations that are done. These ones you can tell are open with the CA, but they haven't been submitted yet uh, to the contractor because if they were, it would be waiting acknowledgement or ready for acknowledgement. And then if they were reconciled, they would be reconciled. So we're going to jump over here. Now, bear with me. We are working on the invoices right now. I'm not sure if it's going to work. It wasn't helping or it wasn't working earlier because um, they are making changes in the back end. This was just going around and around and around. It looks like it's going to do the same. Yeah, here. I do have this invoice we can look at. It just takes a minute to pop open. Here we go. So here, here's what it looks like. Again, apologies, it's it's being finicky today because our team is working on it. Um, but you really just, I mean, this is what it's going to look like regardless. Um, you would come down here. Oh, now it's freezing up on me. There we go. So this one's already been generated. I click generate on it. Um, you get your sections A. So this was that $8,000 one that I had before, just in tender items, right? Um, so we would see our uh, uh, the six items that we just reconciled up here. These are all OPAs here. Section B, again, here's your claims, fuel adjustments. Section C is just mostly hold back, set offs, stuff like that. And section D basically flows the same as the PHCC form. Um, you're just going to click generate and then click submit and it'll go to the CA. This will be a list of your OPAs. It won't, there won't be anything to input here. It'll just list them so you know which ones are on. You can click them out. There'll be a hyperlink that you can go view the source record. Um, same for lean, same for claims. And then this is going to be all your quantities here that you submitted or your quantity records, I should say. Again, click hyperlink out. Signatures, this will be um, supplemented when it goes through the approval process. Uh, the system has uh, automatic signature with a pin. Um, 
that you can use to approve within the system. That's about it. There's a few questions here. Uh, will there be an option on CRs to elevate to arbitration in the case that it is a decision is not made within the allotted time frame? Previously, this option was only available. Um, if we're talking about adjudication, um, we have that ability up in CR. Uh, we're going to go through CR next, actually, just quickly. We're running out of time here, but um, we have uh, an out of the box. It's not an integration, but it's uh, it's built as per the ODEC requirements. So we have a process with workflows and fields that are exactly what ODEC requires. Um, it has some validations in there. So you once you create or once you click adjudic adjudication, um, the adjudication window won't start until you've received a certificate of adjudication from ODEC, uploaded it to the site and submitted it. Uh, we then get the adjudicator involved as well, and uh, it uh, kind of tracks things through there. The adjudication process still happens outside of the system, obviously, but the decision from that will be enacted through that adjudication piece of the dispute resolution process, um, and that's how it will flow through to the invoice. Or if there's time involved, that's how the time will be adjusted on the contract. Uh, is the app available in a different view other than dark mode? Some, oh, yes, sorry, I should say that. This is just a beta that I like because I stare at it all day, but you have a nice light theme here that you can see everything a lot better in. Thanks for reminding me. Uh, Noah? Can you have a white background with black letters? Yep. <laughs> yeah, right here. So no worries, you just go up here in your settings. And we cover this in general functionality training too. So you've got a lot of settings here. Send copy of received messages to my email. Make sure that's checked. And then anything you get in the system, we'll send it to you. Um, you know, you can get summaries sent to yourself, all this good stuff, advanced display. Set up your password here. This is your signature where you can upload a signature here. You just upload an image, put in a pin, you're good to go. Offline mode here. More so for the CAs, but yeah. OK. Quickly through here, information requests are really simple. I'll go through this really quickly, but uh, I'd, again, I'd rather demo it for you. Um, you know, you have your fields here. You have to fill out your subject and then you just have your three reasons. You toggle whichever one it is. Your details of request, it looks small, but that's going to tumble down, down and down. You could put a whole essay in there if you wanted. Um, you just fill out your details section, like I said. Um, oh, this is for compensation request. Uh, I, I combine them because they're they're very similar. So um, I need to update this screenshot. Apologies. Um, same thing. I mean, obviously, CRs carry a lot more levity with them, but um, they, they're basically the same thing. You're going to fill out uh, what your reason is and then your details. You're going to upload a lot of attachments, we hope, um, to help support. Uh, whatever the request is, and then the CR is going to go up through um, the OFMA uh, to get uh, permission to to spend the money, and it's going to result in two things. It'll be a response to your CR, uh, you know, with a capital D decision, and then it'll have uh, a change order if we agree with uh, compensation. Change order would be for time or money now as well. So that's something else in the previous system. If you submitted for time. Uh, especially in a claim. If you want time in a claim, we had no way of enacting that change to the contract time. We do now. Um, so if you win a claim, uh, we can just in basically in the background, it'll go to the head of construction, but we have an internal function that we're building that will just automatically update the contract time. And another system demonstration here. Does the system time out like WBCMS while completing entries? Yes. So this is another uh, question. Unfortunately, um, we are we are beholden to that 20 minute timeout period by like all of OPS is. Um, it's uh, it's a security thing. Uh, it's to do with digital security. Um, so we don't really like it any more than anybody else, and it it bothers us just as much. But uh, our hand, our hands are are tied on that one. Uh, okay, IR and CR. We'll do IR quickly. Whoops. Yeah. 
notice the system's nice and fast as well. And this is just a, a development environment. Oh. Okay, testing IR is one, two, three. Record initiator. All this is just automatic status. You don't have to worry about. Here's the reason here. Now this is gonna. You can fill out as much as you want there. Pop it open here. So you can see I can quit fit quite a lot into there. And then when this exports to a portable file, I would have a nice big long um, you know, screen uh, with all the details. Jump out of, oh, no, I'm not done. Comments and references, so. Um, add whatever photos you want there. Save close. Looks good. Yeah, there you can see the whole the whole screen, eh? And then submit. So now it's with the uh, it's with the CA. I'm just gonna pop up here again. You can say here. So as a CA, there I get a notification. Um, because it's mobile too, if you have the app on your phone and you're logged in, you're gonna get notifications on your phone as well, which is nice. Um, it doesn't really, you know, apply to you folks, but uh, this elevate. This is, you know, if the CA needs some consultation internally, they can elevate uh, because we have our engineering on now too, or we're bringing engineering on um, in the summer. Uh, I would theoretically be able to send an information request directly to a structural engineer or a geotechnical engineer or someone in project delivery to get some clarification on something, uh, get some drawings, whatever. Um, in order, in order to answer and inform this information request, more information I can send it back to you if I uh, if I need more information, uh, or I can just save. Uh, compensation requests. Oops, we'll do really quickly. It's a little more involved, but it's still very basic as far as what it requires. From the user, so change in the work, or let's say unresolved price order negotiation. See here, so when you choose unresolved price order negotiation, you have to choose which change order it is. So you choose which change order it is. You can attach any attachments you'd like and then save close this create change management button. It's only there because I'm logged in as an admin, so you you uh, you can only submit for review. Now you see it comes to me. Oops, this one. And same or similarly to um, IRs, I can send to the CSA for review. As a CA, we have to fill out a report. Um, so there's this whole CA recommendation again. You know, you have to fill it all out. It makes a nice big report there. Uh, this is what we use to internally analyze uh, your requests and determine what quantum and disposition we should issue uh, in response to them. Um, but if there's nothing else, I just save. And then now this is back to the contractor. See? Oh, where'd it go? Oh, whoops, I went back into it. That's why the button's gone, sorry. So here, you as the contractor, you can close, go to adjudication. Oh, it's missing a button here. I'll have to check on that. But yeah, that's the CR. There should just be an accept button too and a PO claim button. So might be because I'm logged in as the administrator. Um, okay. I saw some questions. Are EOTs still under compensation requests? Yes, they are. They, I expect they will be for some time just because we made the business change uh, recently. Will the contractor be able to see the CA's recommendation? No, no, they won't. It's, it's, I understand it's a little confusing. When I'm logged in as an administrator, we can see kind of everything. Um, but if I didn't do that, I would constantly be logging out and back in and you guys would have to 
watch me make a bunch of typos and stuff like that. So, no, the CA's, uh, CA's recommendations are, certainly is hidden from the contractor. Um, that is all I had. Uh, we got about 20 minutes for questions, but we've been knocking them off fairly well as we go, I believe. Okay, uh, will CMS include user guides attachments for contractors to clarify doubts? Yeah, for sure. I don't. I, I don't. I hope you don't have doubts, but uh, we we will have or we do have um, user guides available for basically every process in the system. They are available in our um, technical publications. Oh, not there. So if you come to the TechPub site, uh, Jamie was speaking to this earlier. I believe it might be in our slides, but this is where this is our new racks. Kind of you used to come to racks for all your PHCC documents. Now you come to MTO Technical Publications. Um, so if you go to Technical Documents here, right along the new case, you see you have CMS. So there's not much here right now, but we're going to be uploading a whole lot of stuff here. Um, we're going to have our user guides, our webinar, like a recorded webinar sessions. Uh, we want to do videos showing how to do different processes. So, yeah. Uh, well, uh, duh, 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 duh. I'm not sure as per Kevin's question. Uh, I don't see Kevin. If uh, Texira, Texira, sorry if I say that wrong. If you want to type your question in or make copy and paste Kevin's, I can't find it, please. Uh, will IRCR be exported PDF? Currently, WCS does not do this and we have to snip them. Um, yes, uh, so most records in the process will have uh, exportable files. Um, you can export. IRs and CRs uh, you, in WBCMS use the uh, reports and then details report, um, but it's it's certainly a lot more user friendly in the new system. Um, in fact, some things get emailed to you like a change order. I believe um, when you get issued a change order, you get an email sent to you if you have that option toggled in the settings that I showed. Um, and you get a copy of that portable form emailed to your email. So if you're not able to log into uh, Kahua or CMS, you can at least get the portable file in your email and review it. Will there be another training session for QC personnel and submissions? Yes, there will be. So um, we are still working on material lab testing. That's the issue um, because it's not fully delivered yet. So we will certainly, yes, be offering something for the QC and we need it for the labs. We'll probably do something for the larger group um, with labs and contractors and um, our emo folks as well, like our uh, engineering materials office folks. OK, well, IRCR. Yeah, OK, yeah, so I, I believe I answered that. Thanks for copy and pasting that. The uh, IR and CR will be exportable. Uh, Kevin, so, oh, yeah, OK. It still has no PDF. Uh, yeah, I don't know if WBCMS does or not. I believe it does, but. Um, There are no cost implications for the contractor, so we expect to see those savings in our bid prices. <laughs> as far as the number, um, there's there's a specification that that will be included in the new contracts, and it's basically uh, very similar to what you have today. It can't be unlimited. There'll be um, I believe three per uh, three subscriptions per contract for contractors, um, unless you know there was some unique uh, circumstances. Um, but you don't need that user administrator subscription anymore. Um, so that's that's basically what's proposed based on our consultation with with Orba and and contractors. Uh, so I don't know. I think uh, this has been. Oh, there's another question. Will submission files be populated as the last WBCMS update prior to we hide to create file system and sub? Oh, OK. Um, so a couple different things. There's a submittals app for formal submissions. Um, it's designed for the engineering folks, but we're going to use it in construction, uh, particularly for um, design build contracts because they'll be in there as well. 
Um, but we also have, so the doc, it was formerly the documents folder or document section, WBC Mass is now the file manager section. We've uh, overhauled the uh, folder structure based on uh, our current business, based on, you know, a bunch of old CA files. Uh, we ran it through CSA team, which is our provincial CSA group. Um, and we've refined it down to what we feel is going to be a very applicable and organized structure for anything that doesn't fall into an app or a process or a formal submission. Um, so yeah, you can expect to see the file manager there where to, to put a lot of the stuff that you used to put documents in. If you have access to multiple contracts or projects in the year, can you transfer labor equipment list to each contract? Yeah, you should be able to export from one and import to the other because it's just an Excel folder that comes across. And even if it wasn't working, you could just copy and paste the fields into a blank one from the other folder if there's some background code or something that's attached to it but i don't believe that would be the case so you should be able to yes transfer between projects will go live affect payment issuance for january's payment no you should be able to pay once you're uh, once we're up there once we're up in adam you may have to re-input um some quantities for it we're not sure how every single contract's going to fall it's difficult when there's so many things in flight but um Um, likewise, will there be a refund for WBCMS subscriptions cut short by CMS? Will we get a refund for covering the licenses going forward for the next five years for contractors and CAs? Short answer is no, there won't be. Do you guys drop that today? Yeah. This is... <laughs> Any other questions? Hope I didn't miss any. Okay, maybe one last one from Dean Ryan, and then I will uh, will wrap things up for this session. But I think it's been a really great session. I've posted um, the feedback form for the session, and we appreciate your comments uh, in there as well. It's really quick to fill out. Um, it will only help us build better sessions as we go forward. Um, so yeah, maybe if we can get Dean's question, we'll uh, wrap it up after that. But yeah, the, the link to that short form is there and should be available to you. So thanks again, everyone. Alrighty. Yeah, so Dean's question. Um, as per the question with regards to the older contracts not using IR and CR and RFCs are not available, what is the expectation as a workaround and where did the RFCs go from WBCMS? So there's two questions there. One's related obviously to dispute resolution, the other one to migration. Um, I don't have the final answer on this because we need to follow up with management, but uh, I suspect the older contracts with RFCs will get a change order to infuse the new spec. Um, that requires the CRs and IRs. I think it's 100 S. 100 S. I can't remember. 19, maybe. Um, so I expect that'll be the case. We'll just make a change order, um, and then new EOTs and compensation requests will come through CRs. Um, and then the second portion, so where is the RFCs going to go if there is no home in CMS for them because we didn't build them, which is a great question. Um, there's a few things that we have foregone uh, in our switch to this new system, um, but when we're migrating because they don't have a home, we have chosen to put those in the file manager. So um, if there's something that doesn't have a place anymore, uh, it's going to be in the file manager. Uh, one instance of that is verification notice. I'm just going to, um, which I should have maybe gone over today, but it's a really simple submission. I'll show it right now. Uh, verification notices serves all of your CFCs, your request to proceeds, your uh, request to place structural concrete, all of that stuff. Um, previously in WBCMS, we barely addressed it. We had a uh, certificate of conformance um, app or record that you know we advised people to attach all their other forms to, and it went back and forth. But we didn't build that in the new one. We just built verification notices. So all of the old CFCs are just going to be migrated to a folder that will be called CFCs. Um, so that will be the same thing for RFCs. You'll have access to them. You can go back and review them. They'll just 
be in a different section. You'll just go to the file manager and you'll have either PDFs or CSV files that you open in Excel to review all of the um, all the information in there. Uh, this is the verification notice here. Just pop it open really quickly. You can say. Here, so request place structural concrete. It's a mandatory attachment. Um, we are we haven't built all of the forms in here because there's so many different types of submissions and drawings and shop drawings and everything else that can be related to this this process of verification notice. Um, so we expect you to attach them. It is a mandatory attachment. So you just those are not required fields either, but it's always good to have it, especially if you want. Um, a notice to proceed and return. You submit that. That's all there is to it. There, I get a little notification. And there, what's that? Oh, and Jamie's got the training session here. So, Jamie, oh, one more question. Have the specs changed and no longer require PHCC forms? I've had several CAs require me to fill in the old PHC. Yeah, <sighs> apologies. It bothers me when CAs do that. It's not their direction either, and they're they're going against direction. But CAs and contractors are contractually beholden to um, the digital equivalent of any any PHCC form. Uh, it's 100 S69 is the spec uh, that applies to construction contracts. It amends the general conditions to require the submission of uh, all services and deliverables and business documents um, through CMS. Um, so that was always the case with WBCMS. It had the thing, anything, any, you know, any terminology, wrote, write, notify, paper, submit, blah, 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 shall all mean um, WBCMS. We have a similar spec uh, for our CA agreements, our engineering agreements, and our construction contracts. So that's what will require um, the the lack of PHCC forms. Will the contractor be able to have multiple levels of authority so that job clerk may not be privy to all pricing? Yeah, so that would be the um, contractor tech I was talking about. Um, they are uh, removed from commercial activity, uh, you know, dispute resolution activity, and they're basically, you know, they do DWRs and uh, uh, sample stuff and, you know, more of the field level stuff. So short answer is yes. Jamie, you want to take it away? I can answer whatever comes up by uh, oh, right. typing no, I in. Think, so. I think that's great. That's a lot of information for everybody in two hours. Um, as I said, there will be future sessions. We'll look to make this, the recording of this session, available. Um, we're just figuring out the logistics behind that, but uh, we are recording these sessions. And uh, again, I want to thank everyone for attending today. And uh, thanks for your your patience as we uh, move forward, but we're really excited to bring the new CMS to everyone. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ryan, for the great presentation. And uh, we'll look forward to moving forward with the solution. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jamie.